happening tomorrow, city leaders and the Western New York Coalition for the Homeless will announce the start of this year's Code Blue and Code Blue 32 initiatives. This means shelters in Buffalo will open for those who need a warm place to stay overnight when wind chills dip below 15 degrees and temperatures go below 32 degrees. The Code Blue time period is tomorrow through March 15th. So how cold is it going to feel tomorrow as we take a live look over downtown Buffalo? I want to welcome you all back. Thank you so much for sticking with us at 1030 tonight. Meteorologist Kaylee Wendt has that answer. Good evening. Good evening, Nalina. Actually, the next few days are going to be the warmest this week, at least. We'll be in the mid-40s tomorrow. And then as we get towards Thursday, the start of the day will be warm as well. But then after that really going to be cooling down quite significantly. Tonight it's already feeling cool in the mid 30s for Buffalo and the further south you travel the cooler it gets. Southern tier spots are sitting in the low 30s and notice it's those areas around the lake shore that are about 10 degrees cooler than where they sat yesterday at this time period and as we move through the night tonight, we'll continue to see that difference get a little bit bigger and bigger. Now, 28 degrees is where the southern tier will fall. Temperatures closer to the metro already near this, but will fall right around freezing. And a lot of the reason for that is because skies are continuing to clear out. Now, as we get into tomorrow, we'll start out the day with clear skies. But by afternoon, we are going to see some clouds begin to move back into the region. And then, you know what comes with the clouds, some rain showers arrive right around sunset tomorrow evening, maybe a little bit later than that. And that's when things are going to continue to change. So of course, we'll see that widespread rain move through late Wednesday through Thursday. By the time we get to Thursday afternoon and temperatures cool down, we'll see some of those raindrops switch over to snowflakes. Friday, a really quiet day, a nice one if you've got to get outside and do some raking, maybe mow the lawn for the probably the last time this season. And then Saturday, another warm day to start, but a cold front swings through by evening, and that's what's going to be bringing some widespread snowfall chances. So it won't be bad at first, but by the time we get to Sunday and that lake effect machine starts going too, we'll have more measurable snowfall amounts south of the city. Kaylee, thank you. It has been two months since Hurricane Maria hit the island of Puerto Rico. Tonight we learn more than 160 utility workers and nearly 100 utility vehicles from New York have arrived on the U.S. territory to help restore power. Power was gradually returning following the hurricane, but last week, as we reported, that massive outage hit, causing more problems. The electric authority there says it was a mechanical problem. Close to 150,000 Puerto Ricans have left the island on their own since the hurricane hit. The governor of Puerto Rico testified on Capitol Hill today, as you can see, calling on the U.S. government for financial accountability and recovery efforts. A Clarence doctor facing a 166-count indictment has pleaded not guilty to his charges. Dr. Eugene Gosi is accused of illegally prescribing pain medications that resulted in six deaths. Dr. Gosi appeared in federal court today. His lawyer asked the judge to change Gosi's current bail agreement, but prosecutors said the current arrangement, which allows Gosi to practice medicine under the supervision of another doctor, relies too much on Gosi's medical judgment, which they say is off. Again, Gosi is still allowed to see patients, but under the supervision of another doctor. We spoke to Gosi's lawyer today to ask if he thinks Gosi is responsible for those six deaths. Is it your opinion that he had no cause in their death? You know, um, any time a doctor loses a patient, it's always a very, very sad event. But um, there are times when, even though you do your best, you, you'll, uh, you'll lose a patient. If convicted, Dr. Gosi faces a minimum of 20 years in prison and a possible $1 million fine. An admitted sex abuser set to be sentenced this morning was not after refusing to leave his cell. 45-year-old Christopher Wright was at the center of a manhunt in Pendleton last year. Wright was arrested in October and charged with sexual abuse and criminal sex act. When he refused to leave his cell this morning for sentencing, a judge issued what's known as a drag order. And literally it means we would have to remove him from his cell and bring him into court. It's very rare. Um, I can only think of maybe a couple other times that this has happened. It's generally it's used by a defendant, uh, you know, just kind of to be difficult. 
Authorities say Wright's victims are under the age of 18, being as young as 13 years old. His next attempt at sentencing is November 28th. In Tampa, an intense manhunt is underway for a suspected serial killer. This morning, police found the body of 60-year-old Ronald Felton in the street. Police believe he was shot from behind in another unprovoked attack. His death follows three other murders last month. Police believe all four could be the work of a person who lives in the community. Do you believe these young women? I am, uh, have no reason to doubt these young women. Today, Attorney General Jeff Sessions did not defend Roy Moore, who is trying to fill his Senate seat amid accusations of sexual misconduct. And in a bizarre new development tonight, our sister station, WKRG, is reporting people are receiving a robocall from someone pretending to be a Washington Post reporter asking for damaging information about Judge Roy Moore. The Post broke the story about a woman who claims Moore tried to have a sexual relationship with her when she was 14. The Post responded tonight, saying in part they are, quote, shocked and appalled that anyone would stoop to this level to discredit real journalism. Also on Capitol Hill today, Attorney General Sessions swore to tell the truth, then swore he always has in his appearances before Congress. Here's Justice Correspondent Jeff Begays. I've always told the truth. It was clear from his opening statement that Attorney General Jeff Sessions knew what was coming. But I will not accept and reject accusations that I have ever lied. That is a lie. But when committee Democrats started questioning him, he was not so certain. I don't recall. I don't believe so. I don't know. Sessions' troubles began in January when he told Senator Al Franken that he had never communicated with Russian operatives during the 2016 election. I did have, not have communications with the Russians, um, and I'm unable to comment on it. But Sessions has since acknowledged meeting with then-Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. And it was also revealed that Sessions was in this campaign meeting where advisor George Papadopoulos offered to go to Russia on behalf of the Trump campaign. Prosecutors say Papadopoulos, who has pled guilty to lying to the FBI, had been in regular contact with Russian operatives and even proposed a meeting between Mr. Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin. New York Democrat Congressman Gerald Nadler. There are reports that you shut George down, in, unquote, when he proposed that meeting with Putin. Is this correct, yes or no? Yes. I pushed back, I'll just say it that way, because it was... Um, oh, you, yes. Your answer yes. is yes. When asked whether Mr. Trump or anyone else expressed an interest in meeting Putin, Sessions again replied... I don't recall it. Republicans pressed Sessions to investigate Hillary Clinton over a controversial uranium deal involving a Russian company and her handling of emails. Sessions has authorized senior DOJ officials to look into whether a special counsel is needed. Jeff Begay's CBS News, Washington. Today, Senate Republican leaders said they want to include a repeal of the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate through their tax bill, according to reporting in The Washington Post. Repealing the mandate would free up more than $300 billion over the next 10 years to pay for those proposed tax cuts, but would result in about 13 million fewer people having health insurance, according to projections from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. Now to an update on a story we first brought you last night at 1030. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee met today to discuss the president's authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. It's the first such hearing on this matter in more than 40 years. It comes amid concerns both in the U.S. and around the world regarding President Trump's command of the U.S. launch system, especially following his heated rhetoric towards North Korea. Last night, we told you even the military can't stop the president, but here's how a former top nuclear commander responded today. Other than to state the, their view about the legality of the move, uh, the president retains constitutional authority to uh, order uh, some military action. And the military is obligated to follow legal orders, but is not obligated to follow illegal orders. The White House has not commented on this hearing, but the Trump administration has said the president is operating under a system with numerous checks in place to discourage him from taking this kind of action. Up next, a really chill Manny Petty. Wait until you hear the special service being offered at this salon.